bit like glasses. I can't see that far. See if it's working. Yeah, it seems like it's it's on. It's on. Hopefully, I've switched off the buzzing and everything. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. It um, feels like one of those TV shows where we kind of got the audience coming back to a twice weekly um, event. Uh, we were talking about obviously the creed, and we got to a semi challenging section um, about the Holy Spirit. I think it's probably important before we carry on that actually we read the prayer of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a prayer that we read at the beginning of really, literally, um, every service. Let's see if I can, should have had it prepared here, it should have been a bit more like Salute Peter. Um, but I haven't. Okay. I know it in Greek, that's why I don't really I'm trying to find it. I'll find it anyway. We carry on and then I'll find it and I'll read it in a minute. We carry on with Christos Anesti and I just don't know it off by heart in English. Oh, here it is. Thank, thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me out there, out of this um, awkward moment of <laughs> catching me out of things. So the prayer that we have, um, Philip, um, we've discussed away from this haven't we before um and i we've said about prayer you know even how do we pray and um what prayers god left us and we believe you know we saw that in in scripture it was just the our father and we've discussed and kind of come to some kind of um agreement that there seems to be three prayers that actually um, separate the Trinity in the essences that we see them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but the Church brings them together in its liturgical life. So we felt that the statement to the Father, which the only one that meant is the Our Father prayer, we said that, didn't we? Um, the prayer for Jesus, the scene that stands out just as a prayer for Jesus, the embodiment of God the Father, is Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, that we know that this is called the Jesus prayer. And what we have now is the prayer for the Holy Spirit. So if our understanding of that we are praying to one God, these three prayers actually truly do that for us, in, in, you know, in its journey. And we will read the, the prayer that is dedicated to the Holy Spirit. O heavenly King, comforter the spirit of truth, who are ever present and filling all things, the treasurer of all blessings and giver of life, come and dwell within us and cleanse us from every blemish and save our souls, O blessed one. I mean, that in itself, is very beautiful which really matches with hopefully what you're going to say today and i will kind of come back to that because i want to make a point but i don't want to take it away from what we're going to kind of talk to today so the note that i was making last week as we were finishing because i do kind of make notes is that it's so important that we understand that god is one and and the the creed Kind of keeps on telling us that it keeps on saying i believe in one god and it kind of wants us to understand that there is only one god and one holy catholic and apostolic church there is it's all about the unity the oneness so <clears throat> the note that i made don't forget i'm representing laity and if i was a lay person i had to understand this i would say that okay i believe that god is one because it makes sense to have one god for everything, for everyone. Um, in Christianity, it, it has been revealed. So this one God, and I understand that the Trinity, it's how God reveals himself to us. 
in the different stages of humanity and its covenant with God. He God is revealed to us in, in different in these kind of stages. So it's how he is revealed, when he's revealed and what we think. So that's that's the note I made um, from what we were talking about last week. So over to you. Yeah, Philip. I think like last week, um, we're going to spend a lot of time on a very small amount of text because okay. it's one, it's very important. Two, I believe that, well, the creed kind of expresses and cements the understanding, the orthodox understanding of the Trinity. So we see that we've come to a point where it says who proceeds from the Father. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit and his procession from the Father. So again, this isn't language that we use in everyday life, who proceeds from the Father. It's quite difficult to kind of grasp that. If, Like we expressed last um, lesson, if the Holy Spirit is not created by the Father, how can it proceed from the Father? So we're going to make that uh, clear, hopefully, by the end of this. Also, this statement establishes the uniqueness of the Trinity to all other Christian traditions. Um, we believe in the Trinity differently to Catholics and Protestants and other forms of Christianity. We have a very, very unique view, an authentic view of the Trinity, which goes back to the establishment of the creed um, and I think it's important to make clear that we've been very uh, careful in what we're going to be saying because it is very um, important that we get this right because uh, slight deviations can can cause problems as we'll see at the end of this as well so I'm going to be using St Basil mostly everything I've got down has got St. Basil backed behind it. Um, and I feel like he explains this complex theology of the Holy Spirit in the best way. We, we have many other theologians, but you know, St. Basil puts in a very simple and um, easily digestible way. And it's one of the recognized teachers mm. of the church. We have them as the three hierarchs and the schools. We use them mostly as yeah. know, in this country. Yeah, so I think that's, he is the ultimate source on the Holy Spirit at the end of the day. He, is, he has a whole text detailing who the Holy Spirit is, um, chapters and chapters. Um, so that's the source that I've been using for, for the information. So St. Basil, he has four statements on the Holy Spirit. Number one, that the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. Number two, that the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son. Number three, that the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. And number four, that the Holy, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. So I feel like the last lesson we covered the first three. We covered yeah. that He is God, He is equal to the Father and the Son, and He is not the Father and the Son. Today we're going to be dealing with St. Basil's fourth statement, which is that he proceeds from the Father through the Son. So, um, we get this, well, St. Basil got this, from Christ's own words. So he revealed the Spirit's divinity and its place in the Trinity himself. Christ says, I will send unto you from the Father even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. So in one sentence, Christ reiterates twice, which is not an accident, that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. He didn't say that he himself only, but yeah. it's from the Father through him. So we can see that the Son does not work separately from the Father in any way. Like we said, St. Basil last week, we probably said it about 50 times, that um, every divine action begins from the Father, works through the Son, and is completed by the Holy Spirit. Um, 
So Christ gives us this understanding from that quote himself. Um, so I think it's important as a kind of introduction that we go through the Father and the Son in a very brief way, brief way, and the Spirit in a brief way to understand their roles in this, in the Trinity. So we see that the Father is the cause and the unifier of God, St. Basil says. So everything begins from the Father. Everything. So like you said last week, if the Father is the mind, or the week before, if the Father is the mind, then everything begins from the mind. We can mm -hmm. see it reflected in humanity. Mm -hmm. We're made in the image of God. You know, that kind of understanding that everything that we do begins from our minds. It's the same way of the Father. So every divine action begins from the Father. If we move on to the Son, He is the Word of God. He is the action of God, the embodiment of God. So everything that God does has to be done through the Son. So St. Gregory, he puts it in a very real way when he says, everything that belongs to the Father belongs to the Son, except His cause except the beginning of things so everything that the father has the son has except this beginningless and then the spirit we see is equal and eternal to the father and the son and this happens in eternity so every divine action let's say it again begins from the father proceeds through the son and is completed by the holy spirit it all happens in eternity before creation during creation when this creation is long gone all of god's actions have the trinity running through it and we can see that that has to happen for god to be one yeah so god must be three in order to be one so saint basil he he really emphasizes that God cannot be one if it's not a trinity. He says that if the Father is the mind, then he had to, his speech is also the Father, then that's separating the Father. So therefore, God is not one. So if the beginning of the creed, it says, I believe in one God, this understanding of the trinity cements that. So God has to be three in order to be one. So that's a very important uh, point to make. Which is a really mind-blowing concept. Yeah. I mean, we're saying it and saying it, and we understand, well, we think we understand it, or we have some acknowledgement of it, we probably, and it's still kind of, um, the fathers are explaining it, we're saying what the fathers are saying, but still I'm just a normal person off the road, that you're just kind of three is one, and one is three, mm. and the father, it doesn't, it kind of, but I understand then if I, if I change my mindset, in other words, I start not thinking them as three, because that's what's difficult. Three becomes one is difficult. But I understand the threeness of a relationship. For someone to truly know me, I have to be three. I'm a thought action. You know, I'm a thought of vocalization and an action. So these things, I am an embodiment of three. I have mm -hmm. to go through a three stages, you know, for me to, um, for someone to really know me. If I was just someone, for example, you could separate my mind, my ideas, my thoughts, and just put it in the corner. And we would say um, that might be the father or the wisdom, the, the Sophia of God, you know, that's why the son would seem to be always, um, checking in with the father to see what is what do you want me to do um and i will do it because of that obedience because it's the one thing it's kind of the recapping that we do we call this um, um what do we call it? reflection you know this kind of relationship of obedience or reflection and any action any action so when we hear that God today made the sun, he made the moon, he made the light, that's the Holy Spirit. The action was the Holy Spirit. That's why we know it was there from the beginning. That's why we always say it's just one. It is there. It's part of it. It's really hard to kind of, because it's separated vocally. We think that it's, um, again, we just see them as three different things. We have to really look within the, the 
when God says we were created in the image of Trinity, then we have to understand the Trinity that we would have for ourselves to really understand the Trinity mm. um, that is um, the God that loves us. Um, so I think that's the only way we're going to really be able to kind of hit the nail on the head for the average Joe is really to kind of really truly understand yourself, to be able to understand the oneness of God in a way. I think uh, a great example from the Old Testament that we can use, and quite a shocking example, is the burning bush. Hmm. Um, we see how, how can God become a burning bush? That doesn't make sense. But we can see that the Trinity reveals itself there. So the flame, the light, what we can see is Christ. And even the words that came out of came out of the burning bush is also Christ. But when Moses asked God, um, who are you? What what can I call you? And Christ responds, I am. This I am is a reference to the Father. Yeah. So Christ is speaking on behalf of the Father. We we only separate them with our language because yeah. we are so constrained. We can't understand things in concepts. We have to understand them through the way our language can cope with it. Um, and we can see the Holy Spirit is the actual fact that this is happening is the Holy Spirit. Because we can't separate at all. Where did that come from? Where did that teaching come from what you just said no you said this, or... this is saint basil this is saint this basil is about the burning saint bush basil. all the burning bush saint basil is every yeah. source is from saint basil so because uh, i would have thought the fire was the holy spirit but obviously i suppose it's and the voice that they heard was christ because that's the voice of god um where is the father <laughs> present because we know the father through the son so mm -hmm. he confessed that i am the father by saying i am um, and the Father is present there in that confession, but um, because obviously, but I understand that the bush would be Christ because that's the physical embodiment of God. But yeah. Well, we see that Saint Basil he gives a different explanation. He says that the bush is the Virgin Mary, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is because it's bearing God. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Which is quite fascinating in itself because I I would never have thought. Wait, so the Virgin Mary, but it's kind of a it the makes bush sense. was pointing towards the Virgin Mary. Because that's the only way we were going to see God mm. through the Virgin Mary, the incarnation. And Moses saw God through the voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how she held create the creator of creation inside of her and she wasn't burnt. The bush didn't burn, did it? It wasn't destroyed. So yeah, I can understand totally one hundred percent where that kind of makes sense yeah um, makes sense to us folks i don't know what makes sense to you but I mean, um, it's really difficult it's really difficult for theologians and philosophers and it is hard yeah. everyone it's just and i think you hit the nail on the head by saying we're limited to a language and we're limited you've got limits um and i suppose that's why god came when he said i didn't give this to the knowledgeable the scholars because it's impossible for you to understand that you're going to have your limits saint basil again he's, he's a genius he's really a genius because he says you cannot understand the holy spirit unless through your own personal actions your own mm. asceticism your own hope for holiness so he says that as we are made in the image of god we have a kind of in our souls a drive to know the trinity if we don't tap into that drive to know the trinity we won't be able to know the trinity you can't understand the trinity through universities or even us speaking now you have to know it in a personal relationship yeah i mean this is a very very diluted coarse way of saying it mm. i know this is recorded and um, this is not to be taken as a teaching, but this is taken as a personal example that, again, you know, as we're talking, things come to mind and I'm allowed to share them. And obviously Philip representing the church 
can guide me, to control me so that I don't go off the rails. But a lot of the times I'm, uh, I'm a son and I had a father and uh, my actions would say to someone, you're just like your dad. You know what you've just done now? It's just like your dad. And it was my action through the son that revealed the father. Mm. So they would say, you must be the son of such and such because the action you've just done is exactly what your dad would do. It could be the face, it could be this, it could be that, whatever it was. And you will see that um, that's a very coarse way of saying it, but I'm just saying that the the Holy Spirit's actions through the Son reveals the Father 100%. I think we can only talk about God in this way, though. Yeah. Um, you know, the language that we use is always limited. So even if we hit the mark in a theological way where this is truly God, you know, we describe him in a way which the church agrees with. Anything that we speak is not a representation of what it truly is yeah. because it's unknowable. Yeah, yeah. I think the Orthodox tradition has a perfect way of viewing God, though, saying that. Because the way we look at God in theological terms, which again is different to other forms of Christianity is we don't look at God who God is we can never look at God who God is we look at who God isn't mm. so we can't determine what God is but we can determine what God isn't okay that's easy so yeah Saint Basil he gives two things that the Holy Spirit isn't which help will help us understand who he is he says that he's not an attribute of God so he's not the love of God, he's not the will of God, he's not anything like that, and he's not a creation of God. Now when I when I read that, that the Holy Spirit is not the love of God, immediately in my mind I thought, but isn't there prayers where the Holy Spirit is referred to as a comforter mm. and um, the love of God and things like that? So I went to another great Father St. Gregory Balamad, he says that this is the case, that the Holy Spirit is not the love of God, but the Holy Spirit may be referred to the love of God as that is how his presence is manifested to us. So that's confusing. Because, oh, because you mean he's compassionate, merciful in that way? Yeah, so you cannot say the Holy Spirit is the love of God. But when the Holy Spirit is present, the love of God is revealed. Because it's the action yeah. of a loving God. Yeah. So, so the Father is the love and not the Holy Spirit the love, but the loving of God is revealed through the action which is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, I mean, it is very difficult, but, you know, we need to, to get to grips with it. We have to look through how the fathers think. Yeah. And this is how they think. They say that the love of God is the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yeah, God as love is all three of them. But the revealing of this presence of love is the Holy Spirit. That's what Gregory Balamaz, St. Gregory Balamaz says to us. And these things are revealed through the Holy Spirit, through the Father's. Mm. You know, it is again. They're supported. It's not. It was through prayer. It's not just their own ideas. Yeah. Um, it's their relationship as it was revealed. You know, now they are obviously lucky for us. It's been written, and and you know we can read and. Um. Saint Basil, because in terms of prayer, the the creed is a kind of prayer as well. Yeah. Um, and he says that. In terms of the worship life of a Christian, he says, If a man calls on God but rejects the Son, his faith is empty. If someone rejects the Spirit, his faith in the Father and the Son is made useless. It is impossible to worship the Son except in the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to call upon the Father except in the Spirit of adoption. So we are made sons of God, like St. Paul says it. Yeah. Small s, yeah, yeah. sons of God, through adoption, and this adoption is um, baptism, yeah, which we're going to cover in 
probably a couple of lessons. But it's this idea that you can't do anything, you can't look at them separately. It's hard to look at each person separately. They are separate, but they will work through each other. The only face of God is Christ, though. Mm. Um, so we can look upon God, but we can't, shouldn't expect to look at three different individuals to see God. God is, you know, the face of God, how we see God is Christ. So, we, you know, we can see it in that way, but not in this separation. We can't separate them and see them and bring them together as a little gang and then call them, you know, they kind of blend together. Um, but, um... My gut instinct, though, is just kind of thing, does it, if I really get the Trinity, would that change my belief? I mean, I know that as a statement of faith, it's very important, but as an average person, I would be thinking, is that stopping me? Is that hindering me? Is it confusing me more? Isn't it just basic that I should just believe and live it and the experience? I mean, living within the church, within the experience, within the Holy Spirit revealed to me the, the oneness you know, through the wisdom of God will come and the compassion and the mercy through communion with the Son in Holy in communion, which is then given to us through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that we ask, um, and, and He gives us, you know, Christ. He gives us back Christ in communion. Um, it's not because it's just too complicated, you can't be bothered, because it's easy to just give up and say, okay, let's move on to the next bit. But this is a really big bit that we want to brush mm -hmm. aside. But um, I think it was wonderful when Christ said, blessed are those who are going to believe without seeing, and they're going to be have more, you know, it's, you know. Um, we, and I suppose it's all, which, which is important, is this historic truth, which is, very important because I suppose the biggest thing then is that um, the word that jumps to mind is trust you know we have to trust you know the church that is giving us this experience um, tr which would be scripture which would be the living church would be whatever it is um, each other is a hard thing I suppose, but we should be able to. We're all in adopted. We're all, ad and how wonderful it is that we're all adopted, and our foster parents are Christ and the Mother of God, the Church and Heaven. Heaven and Earth are our adopted parents. I mean, that's amazing. That complete image of that phrase comes to mind. The best of both worlds, in a way, comes to mind. It's an amazing kind of thing that. Um, we have to be able to be part of the greatest creation of God um, in the image of God himself, you know, in Trinity, amazing. That's, yeah. Sorry, that was just a, a hippie moment. Yeah, you go on with them. Um... No, I mean, it is important because St. Basil, he, he says that all knowledge, all true knowledge comes from the spirit of knowledge, mm. which is the Holy Spirit. So all knowledge, truthful knowledge, comes from the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of impossible not to come to the Holy Spirit, not to come to knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. So when you're saying that, how does it have an effect on the daily lives of everyone? It may not have a real tangible uh, effect where you can see it but the knowledge that you're gaining is being given to you through the Holy Spirit but we did say a couple of lessons ago that Christ is enough that's why God is always portrayed in an icon as Christ yeah so if we come to Christ it's, it's enough like Saint Cyril of Jerusalem he says about Holy Communion that it's not only Christ that we are communion. communion with, it's also the Father and the Holy Spirit. You know, so we can see that as Orthodox Christians, we can have a relationship with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one. Which is different to other Christians. Other Christians believe that the Father is unknowable. 
and we can only know the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's what orthodoxy, why it's unique. We believe we can know all three through each other. Um, yeah. And that's, that is why this statement that we've just said, these five words, why it caused the Catholic and Orthodox split. Because we see that a couple of hundred years after uh, this statement was made, the creed was made, that the Western Church decided to add and the Son. That's all they added, and the Son. So instead of it being who proceeds from the Father, it is in the Western tradition, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, that makes exactly what St. Basil said the Holy Spirit isn't, which is a creation of God. Of God, yeah. The Holy Spirit isn't a product of God. The Holy Spirit is not separate from God. The Holy Spirit is not lesser than the Father and the Son. All of them are equal. All of them are God. All of them are knowable. In terms of, I think we'll come to that after, but all of them are knowable through each other's actions. That's, that, that is the uniqueness of orthodoxy. Which is a big thing. That's why maybe we have the label orthodox. Yeah. So we maintain that truth, that yeah. correctness. Vladimir Lossky, who lived not too long ago, 50 years ago, I think he passed away. He says that orthodoxy guards the truth of the Trinity. So orthodoxy is the only thing which protects God, true knowledge of God. In its wholeness. In its wholeness, yeah. So everything might point towards God, but the trueness, the wholeness of who God is, is always and only found in orthodoxy, in its fullness. Because God is everywhere. And if you look at creation, it all points towards God. Yeah. But the fullness can only be found through orthodoxy yeah no no it's, it's it's well explained to be fair we'll just be it's just going over the same thing as many different ways as we can i mm. suppose but um the beautiful thing is with the, the dogmatic theology of the church that means we're always going to come back to god um as one you know as, in, and that's an amazing thing. At least all these things that we're doing, we're always coming back to. It's always bringing us back to one truth, one reality, which is important. Um, I read in an introduction to um, one of the books on the Trinity, uh, on, of the Fathers, that the author says that this part of the creed, through the uh, Father, uh, present. Who proceeds from the Father, um, bookends the idea of God. So when we open up the book of God, let's say, you see, I believe in one God, the start of the creed. And then if we make our way all the way to the back of the book, it says, who proceeds from the Father. So it kind of closes the understanding of God. And we'll see that next... Um, lesson where we speak about um, and in one holy catholic and apostolic church we can see that if we have a true understanding of god then we can start talking about one holy catholic and apostolic church so it kind of bookends the, the creed about god and it moves on to the church so this so the tradition where um, baptism is the entry into the church and a catechism before chrismation in some traditions, they, they want you to do all this as a lesson, don't they? Mm -hmm. And then you come to this, to be able to say the creed and then to be able to commune with God with this, you know, with this kind of knowledge, as they will say, um, which sounds good in... In the reality, you will say that's a very good thing and probably something that the Orthodox Church needs to adopt, not to 
restrict communion after baptism, but to have uh, the importance of this sharing the truth, you know, to have a bit more, um, it's something that we were talking about before now with um, Philip, it was the, kind of our next session, what can we do next? We haven't finished this, but um, we're just obviously thinking ahead a little bit. Um, and this beautiful feast that we missed out on as a people, as a collective, was called Easter. Um, all the other feasts within Easter that kind of we didn't have together and we tried to do as whatever we could do, um, we haven't missed out as we think because the Holy Liturgy has all of that in it. Um, so we were thinking that the next kind of topic will be, once we finish this, we'll be actually going through the journey of the Holy Liturgy. Um, and the reality that when we do come back as a collective into these buildings, um, you will be able to live definitely 100% um, that joy. You might not have the attributes of the feast, like holding up a candle and singing Christ has risen, but the Sunday liturgy is a liturgy of the resurrection. So you do have that, and it doesn't happen with the liturgies during the week, it's only on the Sunday liturgy. I did have a question, but I don't know if it'd be unfair to ask it. Maybe I should pre prepare you for it. It was just something I was reading, and I just wanted to know why it was written that way and not written a different way, but... Um, it might not be fair. I mean, if you don't know the answer, you can always say you can come back to me. Um, and I think it's important that what the Archdiocese is doing now um, is offering the opening the doors to the education of the church, which is um, we would call Catechesis, uh, Catechumen lesson. Um, and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, long awaited in some ways. Um, and I think it's very important that you see by going to their websites um, or following other people that maybe you might be friends with that are, are watching these things. Um, and this will build a little bit of a family as well. I know wonderful things happen as well sometimes outside in different countries. And we can watch, you know, obviously, of course, a lot of other YouTube clips and a lot of other things that are happening. But don't forget, we're all here. We're all relatives of this diocese. We're all relatives here. And it's nice to grow as a family. Um, yesterday, I explained you weren't here, Philip. When I had Kiriakos here, we were doing um, the Orthodox Children's Book Club. And I explained that even how you two, why are you two young boys you know, within the church, and how did you come into it, and how it was, and it was actually because of the collective, the greater Orthodox Church, rather than the singular parish church, so it was coming to summer camps, it was joining maybe youth groups, it was um, seeing that you weren't um, the only person this way, obviously having the life in the church, uh, it seems a bit unfair that it's... Um, that it's only boys that can come into the altar um, to serve in that way. But, you know, you had this, and it's, so just knowing about it, if we actually understood it just from words, it wouldn't really come to life, would it? You do need to live it. Um, you do need to live it. Um, and I think that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. It, it is in everything, everywhere, and it actually is. Even the breath that we breathe in, and you know, we make that into a prayer, and um, it's an amazing, you know, it's it definitely does have to be lived. Um, the question I'll ask you at the end, I don't know what we're, how we're doing with time, but I know we haven't covered, I don't know if we've covered all your notes that you've made, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time, but. No, we have, oh no, we seem to have. Oh. oh no, yeah, we've got plenty of time. Okay. Another 24 minutes. But no, have you finished? No, have you finished your notes? And I can ask you the question. Have you gone? Have we finished? Oh no, I've, I've got a little, little, little bit left. Should we do that at the end to finish it off? You mean like that? Yeah. 
I'll ask you the question. Um, so when I'm reading some of the morning prayers, um, the spelling of the Son, as my understanding is Christ, is actually spelled S-U-N as Son and not S-O-N. Um, so at the beginning I thought, is that spelling mistake or is that kind of, you know, what, or, you know why would they... In some ways it kind of made it beautiful because I understood then, oh, there is one God then, because it's kind of, it can explain the energy in a way that without having to make it another being, it can understand part of creation, but that's just me thinking just for the, you know, I just didn't get it. So why S-U-N and not S-O-N? It's really strange that you ask that question because I'm not even joking. This is unplanned. It's actually the what I'm gonna what I was about to go into as well. So really? Yeah, yeah, I'm not joking. So it's the idea of how do we know God? They won't believe this. They think it's just a setup. It's like a double I act, promise. isn't it? <laughs> Batman and Robin. We've set it up. Yeah, it's actually quite true, isn't it? So, this is like countdown. So, yeah, look, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like we we said in the past couple of weeks that God itself, himself, is unknowable. But we are talking as if we know God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, what's being revealed to us. Yeah. Saint Gregory Balamas, he gives this, you know, just a perfect way of explaining this. He says that well, he gives this kind of analogy of the sun and its rays. So, God, if we compare God to the sun, um, S-U-N, mm -hmm. the closer you get to the sun, the more likely you are to be blinded, then to completely burn up, and then you disappear. Because God's, the sun's glory, to use that poetic words, the heat, the radiation would, it's just unbearable for us. Um, and the Orthodox believe that about God himself. The essence of God is unknowable. So the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in one sense, their true self, their true essence is completely unknowable. But if you look at the sun's rays, I think we, we spoke about it briefly last week. How different are the sun's rays to the sun? Are the sun's rays part of the sun? Yes, is the answer, because everything that the essence, the, the real sun has, is contained within these rays. Mm. So we are able to know God through these rays, the sun's rays, because these rays are 100% the sun, but they're still bearable for us. So you can see how creation points towards God, because God, the energies of God, which we're able to come into contact and have a relationship with um, will not burn us up like the essence um, we are simply able to comprehend that um, within us so it's this it's that idea that God is you can almost call him the sun yeah. because the sun itself is pointing towards God the theology of the sun in the sky is pointing towards God amazing then so yeah, it was kind of funny that how I was, I was going to ask you a few times, but it kind of came, I read it today as well, and I was just thinking now, I'll ask you. I know it's not nice to put you on the spot, because we don't always know everything. Um, and what I mean again is, sometimes people, we have to have patience. I'm representing you, you have to remember this. And these sessions, um, our, our conversations away from the streaming is different. But now I'm, you know, it's in a way that I'm representing. So the representing is that I had a question for the church. I had to be patient. The church might have not been able to have the answer for me straight away. The church has to be patient with me. They have to explain it until I get it in a way. Um, so these are the kind of things that, and if the church does know it, it's open to kind of share it with us and tell us. It's not a secret or a mystery to have control over us and say, oh, I'm not going to tell you that because then I can have the upper hand. 
Um, because as you were talking, it kind of reminded me of that um, ancient Greek story of the man with the wax wings that was flying towards the sun. Mm. Um, and he understood the power, the energy, the beauty of that sun. And, but he was going there with ego, pride, um, eros, and a romantic idea, which then burnt the wings because God, he was unapproachable. Because it's only through Christ can we approach this, because Christ becomes for us then this armour, which is the Holy Spirit, that allows us to come as close to the Son, which is S-U-N, which is the Father, without burning at all, which we were saying before with the burning bush and the Virgin Mary. Um, so yeah, I just kind of, that story quickly came to mind as I was thinking now when you were explaining to me the the heat, the energy, the benefit of, you know, the, we can still benefit from the father as a son, as the son is the son in the rays, and we feel everything. We're not missing out from the son, apart from, you know, you know it would, throughout, without Christ, in other words, without going through Christ, we would just, it would consume us, it would burn us, we would be, and maybe this is the difference between the same son the light, this power that exists in heaven and will exist in hell without protection, this is unbearable for us. Yeah. Without Christ, you can't bear this sun. Yeah, I think because to say that the presence of God is not everywhere is reducing God to not God. Yeah. So even in this idea of hell, hell was destroyed by Christ. The hell that we will feel is the kind of unbearable the the light that we cannot bear yeah so the hell what he destroyed was it's 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 Physical. delusion the delusion yeah. that there there's no eternal life that there's no yeah. heaven god doesn't love us it was an imprisonment he broke the prison there's no there's no prison anymore um so there will be um, an existence eternal life can live I think um, what's interesting is how the sun itself, the physical sun in the sky, how that really does reflect God and how he works. Because like God's energies, St. Balama, Gregory Balamas, he says that this energy is everywhere, pervades all things. It's absolutely, there's nowhere where this energy is not. In the same way, the sun in the sky the light goes straight to the earth. Um, the only way that we won't be able to feel or look at the sun is if we hide in a building or cover ourselves, something like that. It's in the same way with the energy of God. We Only we stop ourselves from feeling it. Forever, yeah. And, and we in the first day of the week is a celebration of this and we call it the day of the sun which is sunday mm -hmm. and there was a lot of ancient spiritual traditions i think in the south americas that had the sun they understood this as the power of life you know day without the sun you know there was no nothing grew nothing you know nothing happened i mean one of the things that we suffer sometimes in in different climates in different countries is the deficiency of vitamin d and this is from the sun and, and, and man seeks the sun. I know it's leisurely and resurrect, you know, recreational and we're kind of thinking of holidays, but we're still, you know, opening ourselves into this kind of, to feel this, you know, this energy, which is a created, it's part of creation, isn't it? It was mm -hmm. created there. Um, not the S-O-N, but the S U N. Yeah. The sun's rays are created, but the energies of God are uncreated. Saint Gregory Balamaz uses words like uncreated light or uncreated grace. You know, we hear even hundreds of years after that, Saint Siloan, Saint Sophroni, all of these people who had knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit. They also speak of things like uncreated light, uncreated grace. Well, it's in the creed, isn't it? Light of light. Yeah. True God of true God. Mm -hmm. 
So it's actually even in the creed itself. So the creed really has covered everything we need to do to be able to say, yes, I believe that there is one God in Trinity. Um, <coughs> so hopefully we're getting there. Okay. Is there anything else, do you think, or what? Um, what we got here? Well, the final part of that verse is who spoke through the prophets. Um, but that I think it's self-evident that it's the Holy Spirit who spoke through the prophets, is what it's saying. Um, and that's the prophets of the Old Testament. So, you know, a Christian can't say, oh, I don't read the Old Testament because this, that and the other, or the New Testament is enough or something like that, which the New Testament is enough, but, um, you know, we see evidence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament through the prophets. Well, yeah, even all the miraculous things would have been, you know, the trials on Egypt. Um, would have been the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so, yeah, they definitely. And what it means is, I suppose, the wisdom of God is known to the people that have opened and have a contrite heart and have become instruments of God. Um, so the as an orchestra, as a band, we're all separate instruments, but we come together and, you know, we kind of, make this sweet sound of um, of truth, which means that we are loved and we have the opportunity um, to accept this love. It's overwhelm overwhelming, so we share it, and we're sharing it because we're in community, and this community means that we can eternally live within a community, and this community that we are citizens of, true citizens, is heaven. So... Um, the message is very simple and the reward is, is wonderful. And I think we covered that with Giriagos actually when we are talking about the talent. He said, you have done great to little and now I will give you more. Um, you can be entrusted with more. So the prophets came for preparation so that we can slowly, slowly accept it for this wonderful thing that we have seen God um, in Christ. I mean... It's quite um, an envious statement to make that there was people that physically have seen God. Um, we try to say that we obviously we see even within ourselves and others and everything. And, but yeah, I'm sure that's why he kept on saying, you know, walk now while you have the life and you know, beware when I'm gone and spend more. Even with Martha, he was saying to her, you know, do what your sister Mary is doing, you know, sit down and listen because I won't be here. You always have the poor, but you won't have me. Um, leave your father to bury your father, the dead to bury the dead, come with me, you know, his time was limited. Okay, that's, I think that wasn't too bad. It was a difficult one, I think. Yeah. Um, because, um, Basil the Great didn't have a lot of patience, a little bit like Peter, he kind of really knew it. He was a great hierarch of the church and a very ecumenical teacher, but um, he kind of, yeah, so it was, so at least he was, I think this, him being able to focus on the Holy Spirit probably softened, um, even with his relationship with um, the people that was a bishop of because it's um, it needs this patient really to kind of in this dubious attitude a personal attitude you know you had to read this and you had to share it you know with us again the studious side of us is actually called prayer we pray to um, allow ourselves to um, be tools of God and help each other okay that's good. So Saturday then, I don't know if we're going to get more questions now because it might have been a bit difficult to 
today. So we might have some questions for Saturday. If not, we just proceed. Um, do you think we will finish Saturday or no? We're going to finish next Thursday because we have um, in one Holy Catholic and Apostolic mm -hmm. Church. That's quite a big, that's more of a history lesson, isn't it? With um, yeah. right to knowledge. Baptism is a big one. And Thursday, no. Okay. Yeah, there's no reason to to rush through them. I think it's very important. And it's, a, it's amazing how we don't say this in the liturgy. It's amazing how sometimes we don't even know this, not necessarily off by heart. I think we should. It's not a difficult thing to know off by heart. Um, but sometimes you see things and you think, what does that mean, this and this and light? What's light got to do with it? And why is Virgin Mary, Pontius Pilate, isn't just Jesus enough? What does all this mean? But all this is, it is God. It's just the one God. Um, uh, amazing. It's an amazing thing. Orthodoxy, we're very, it's a very rich, very, very, very rich um, faith. Um, and the more we appreciate it, the more we learn it, the easier it is to live it, and the more we become regal in ourselves because we're clothed in this richness and you've got no choice you're going to look regal it's going to you know feel that way which comes across hopefully not arrogance but it does say before we say the i father prayer in the liturgy we say and with boldness you know we do say with this boldness we say the our father prayer which seems quite arrogant but it means that you know it's the confidence, this confidence. It's... Okay, I was going to say, I don't know what, how much time we've got. We've got seven minutes, got 13 minutes left. So in this prayer that it says, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, um, who are ever present, fill us all things, the treasure of all blessings, which is just said, the giver of life, come and dwell within us and cleanse us from every blemish and save our souls, O blessed one. So you can see that from this statement, it doesn't, even though we know it's to the Comforter that we understand as the Holy Spirit, it still gives us the essence that this is God. It hasn't separated us completely at all, anything. It hasn't said that, you know, it's, um, it is just the, the energies, the spirit, the treasure, the, the life, the is um, as we know um, the power of forgiveness as we know because it heals all our blemishes salvation is this this god in the holy spirit so yeah so i think what we do we finish there before i end up just over waffling um, and we see you Saturday. I mean, we try to pick up any questions um, and we will um, try to hopefully have, if possible, um, answers. Uh, we'll just sing um, Christ has risen um, and then we can see you Saturday. Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and those in the tombs has bestowed life. Ali, Thos, and Estio, Give me all.